Tonight, I think we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit because the title is Receive the Holy Spirit. Um, so I think we're supposed to be talking about the Holy Spirit. So I have my favorite prayer in front of me and we'll begin with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with the life in you, that I may love the things you love and do what you would do. Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until my will is one with yours to do and to endure. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, until this earthly part of me glows with your fire divine. Breathe on me, breath of God, so I shall never die, but live with you the perfect life in your eternity. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We'll be talking about uh, the third person of the Trinity. According to um, the sacred scriptures, uh, the fathers of the church and the doctors of the church, mainly St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. And also I will be using a great article or a work of um, Peter John Cameron, who is the editor and founder of Magnificat, the little booklet that we, some of you probably know, it's a monthly thing, um, with the readings for every day and meditations. And I actually met him. He goes to Poland um, twice a year to teach the Dominicans in Poland. Um, very humble and intelligent guy. So he wrote a great book, uh, a great work, and I will probably just give you the title. You can read it afterwards. I really recommend it. It will help you grasp the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, how he corresponds them to uh, the virtues, and also how he... Um, connects them with uh, the Beatitudes and how he connects it with the teaching of St. Augustine. It's, it's a great work. So who is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost <laughs> is the third person of the Blessed Trinity, believe it or not. Though really distinct as a person, of course, because we went through that, from the Father and the Son, He is consubstantial with them, being God like them. He possesses with them one and the same divine essence or nature. And we went through that. And I thought it would be good maybe in the beginning to talk about the symbols of the Holy Spirit, um, because we have been reading her, uh, we've heard about anointing, for example. Some of you will be um, confirmed. And, for example, one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit is water. As we know, in baptism, uh, it signifies new birth, life given to us in the Holy Spirit. Another symbol, before I, before I go to explain about the Holy Spirit, is anointing. Its full force can be grasped only in the relation of the primary anointing accomplished by the Holy Spirit, that of Jesus, because what Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ was, he was the Messiah, and the Messiah means the anointed one. So the first anointing that through the Holy Spirit, anointing of Jesus as the Messiah, it works exactly like it worked with the waters of baptism. Jesus did not need uh, baptism, but he was baptized by John the Baptist to sanctify all the waters and to give an example to all people. Um, to be baptized. Another symbol is fire. And actually today, in today's gospel, Jesus talks about it. He calls down the fire and he wants to burn, he wants this fire to burn, burn, burn everything. Um, it was pretty a uh, scary gospel. Symbolizing the transforming energy of the Holy Spirit's actions. The prayer of prophet Elijah, who arose like fire, um, and he proclaims Christ as the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus will say of the Holy Spirit, and he said that today, I came to cast fire upon the earth, and would that, and would that it were already kindled. That was in today's gospel. Also, 
How many of you went to Savannah? Not, no, none of you. For the ordination of the bishop, there you go. What was the weather like? Rainy. Yeah, it was cloudy. But do you know that one of the symbols of the presence of the Holy Spirit are clouds? I was actually talking about it today in today's homily in the morning. Yes, clouds are the symbol of the Holy Spirit, of His presence. Um, for example, at Mount Sinai, um, at the tent of meeting and during the wandering in the desert and with Solomon in the dedication of the temple, but also at the transfiguration. The Spirit in the cloud came and other overshadowed Jesus, Moses and Elijah, Peter, James and John. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my Son, my Chosen, listen to Him. Another symbol is the seal. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. These words were, are said to, um, first of all, every deacon in the hierarchy of, of ordination in the Catholic Church. The deacon, because he will be proclaiming the Gospels. That's what he gets. His character, um, there, are, there are different degrees, different characters, different seals that can be, um, what do you call it? Stamped, Stamped on the soul. And one of them is during the um, ordination of a deacon. Uh, the character of this ordination is servanthood. Then ordination of a, of a priest is the priestly character. It never goes away. It's a seal on my soul as a priest that never goes away. You know, you all heard about priests leaving the priesthood. But they never cease to be priests. Oh yeah, if someone is dying and they are in a car accident scene, they can actually absolve this person, even if they were aliasized. They can do it because they never lose this car. It's a seal that goes to eternity. After they die, they will have this priestly character on their soul. That's how they will be selected there. With the bishop, it's another sealing with the seal of the Holy Spirit. The bishop receives the fullness of gifts in participation of the Eucharist. That's why he receives the fullest of the priestly ordination. He participates in the Eucharist, in the celebration of the Eucharist, in the fullest sense. That's what happened on Tuesday. That's why the clouds, that's why we could all feel the presence of the Holy Spirit above the city of Savannah. Also, one of the symbols in the scriptures, these are all from the scriptures, is the hand. Jesus heals the sick and blesses little children by laying hands on them. In his name the Apostle will do the same, even more point, um, pointedly. It is by the Apostle's imposition of hands that the Holy Spirit is given, always. If this is missing, ordination did not happen. Either for, you know, remember, the laying on of hands is when the Holy Spirit comes in. That's what happened at the ordination of the bishop. It happens with deacons and it happens with priests. I remember at my priestly ordination just last June, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> um, I remember when I got up from the floor when they were singing the litany of the saints and we were all on the floor prostrate. I was just waiting. I'm like, okay, 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 let's just go to the bishop so he can lay his hands and we can become priests. Yes, before someone interrupts and says, no, not do it. Then it's too late. Well, it happened. <laughs> you know how it is like with marriages, yeah? If someone has something against it, speak now or just remain silent forever. <laughs> Nothing happened. Uh, the finger is by the finger of God that Jesus cast out demons. If God's law was written, and I remember um, um, Moses on Mount, who was writing the Ten Commandments on the tablets, the finger of God, the Holy Spirit. Um, God's law was written on the tablets of stone by the finger of God. Then the letter from Christ entrusted to the care of the apostles is written with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And the last symbol, the cute little one that needs to go to a cage. It's the dove. At the end of the flood, remember that? Um, at the end of the flood, the great flood, whose uh, symbolism refers to baptism, 
a dove released by Noah returns with a fresh olive tree branch and it's, um, it's a sign that the earth was again habitab habitable. When Christ comes up from the water of his baptism, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes down upon him and remains with him. So who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God. And the fathers of the church, speaking um, throughout our tradition, put it here because it vibrates, speak about it. And I have few examples only, not too many. Um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 691, Holy Spirit is the proper name of the one who we adore and glorified with the Father and the Son. The Church has received this name from the Lord and professes it in the baptism of her new children. The term Spirit translates the Hebrew word Ruach, which its primary sense means breath, air, wind. You remember the um, breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with the life in you. Jesus indeed uses the sensory image of the wind to suggest to Nicodemus the transcendent newness of him who is personally God's breath, the divine spirit, the word of God. On the other hand, spirit and holy are divine attributes common to the three divine persons. Always holy God, spiritual being. By joining the two terms, scripture, liturgy and theological language designate the inexpressible person of the Holy Spirit without any possible equivocation with other uses of the term spirit and holy. That's the Catholic Church. It's always dense, simple to read. This is one true God. Trinity and unity, always inseparable. One God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now I'm reading the examples from the fathers of the Church. We call the Father God, the Son God, and the Holy Spirit God. And that was written in the 3rd century. Then St. Ambrose, who then can dare to say that the Holy Spirit is separated from the Father and the Son, since through Him we attain to the image and likeness of God? And through Him, as the Apostle Peter says, are partakers of the divine nature. As we go through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you will realize how the Holy Spirit actually acts in our lives. So I'm not going to go into this right now. Um, now, the Nicene Creed. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who is proceeding from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who spoke through the prophets. St. Ambrose, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee, and that holy thing, they used thing, it was about Jesus, um, just bad translation, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. Without doubt, the Holy Spirit is also be adored, since he who, according to the flesh, was born of the Holy Spirit is adored. Yeah? The one who was born of the Holy Spirit is adored, and the, uh, adored from the Holy Spirit, because Holy Spirit is the breath of God, is God. There are no spoken of as thee, they are not spoken of as three in the plural number, but one, the Trinity itself, as the Father God, the Son God, and the Holy Spirit God, Augustine. Do you say God says or God say? Says. Says. Singular. There you go. Even in English it works. <laughs> Just learn it right now. The scriptures, I will go through the Old Testament, which is just actually printed right now, and then I will go through um, many examples from the New Testament to, um, to talk to you, to just draw this image of Holy Spirit as God, and then we'll go and move on to the Holy Spirit as a person. And the uh, uh, Old Testament, there are many, 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 many examples. In Genesis, for example, now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God, that's what I wanted to say before, but I forgot the name, the word hovering. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. 
The Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. That Job. Psalm 104. When you send your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the earth. You just see right now, maybe, for the first time, that the Scriptures is full of this Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is the author of the Scriptures, actually. We know that. It's not only about God the Father, it's not only about Jesus, but it's also a lot about the Holy Spirit, the same God. The Holy Spirit is described as creative, life-giving, and life-sustaining. It is, the, it is a, any wonder that in the New Testament uh, they would be similarly described in John Corinthians. The Holy Spirit strives with men. My spirit will, will not contend with men forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years, Genesis. The Holy Spirit is a teacher and guide, um, Job. But is the Holy Spirit is a man, the breath of the Almighty, that gives him understanding, gives understanding to Job. And again, Psalm 143, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. The Holy Spirit is the manifestation of God's presence, as we said before. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Psalm 51. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If the Holy Spirit was hovering above the whole entire earth. There is no way you can escape it. The Holy Spirit's special relationship with Israel. It, there was, by the waters of Meribah, they agreed, they angered the Lord, and trouble came to Moses because of them, for they rebelled against the Spirit of God, and rash words came from Moses' lips. The Holy Spirit filled and empowered men in the Old Testament, as we know. Um, Joseph, so Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Genesis. Joshua, take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hands on him, the Spirit of God. So, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power, and you will prophesy with them. David, the Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, and many others, all the prophets, of course, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Micah, Others who spoke of men, they are not prophets, but they spoke of, of God to other men. Many examples from the Old Testament testify to the presence of the Holy Spirit in the midst of the people, in the Old Testament, before people even knew that God was in three persons. Yeah? All of it was, was Yahweh and Adonai. The Spirit of God made me, and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Only God is the creator of life. Job. Now, the New Testament, there are countless numbers of examples. J uh, Matthew, Luke, Jesus says, Blasph blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So who is the Holy Spirit? He's God, because only God can be blasphemed. John, 20, John 4, God is a spirit, the Holy Spirit, and they who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The Father and the Son send the Counselor, the Holy Spirit. Peter tells um, Ananias that he lied to the Holy Spirit and that he has not lied to men, but to God. Romans, Corinthians, Hebrews, Peter, all the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also a person, of course, one of the persons of the Trinity, distinctive, and the scriptures says about it, the Holy Spirit will teach you, he's a teacher, in that hour that you ought to say, he, the Holy Spirit, teaches the faithful, and as we'll talk about it, um, it's a spirit of courage also, spirit of understanding, of wisdom, of knowledge, of fear of the Lord, seven different spirits, one would say, but it's really one spirit. Seven different predispositions, attributes, strengthening the ways in which God strengthens our will. These are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why do we have them? 
Oh, why did the apostles have them? Because they were scared and they were running away. And when the Spirit of God came upon them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they immediately knew what to do. Their mission was introduced to them, infused through the working of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness to me. He, the Holy Spirit, is a person, not a thing. If I do not go, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I, Jesus, will send him to you. The Spirit of God, why do we need the Spirit of God? Because the Spirit of God transforms us. The Spirit of God is a Spirit of transformation. In the beginning of the chapter, we had a story of a saint, I remember who it was, Pierre Toussaint, yeah? Well, it's just one of the stories of people whose lives were not only transformed by the Holy Spirit, because deep inside, I mean, he was a good person, but sometimes we see those people who, in our eyes, are not good people, yeah? They stray. And the Spirit of God is always there, after them, fighting for them, bringing them eventually if they let him in because he never gives up but he also never breaks the um, autonomy of every human person our free will so the Spirit of God is after every single one of us he wants to possess our hearts to bring them back to God that's his role that's the sanctifying role of the Holy Spirit in everything it's just so broad that the again, examples can be multiply and multiply because this Holy Spirit was sent by God to dwell among us, dwell in the church, and sanctify all the people of God through the church, through the scripture, through the teaching, through the preaching, all of these things. And it goes, essentially, goes down to seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said these words to the apostles in the Acts of the Apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and to the ends of the world saying to those who are scared and frightened and have no idea what to do and they accomplish the great mission because the Holy Spirit led them and the Holy Spirit is the source of every priestly power for example the imposition of the Holy Spirit you remember what we say during the Mass let your Holy Spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy and we ring the bell three times for the Trinity. No one else can say it, yeah? Superpower. In giving us the theological virtues, the Holy Spirit makes His dwelling in us since the rich blessing of every description, making us daily more like Christ. And this is the great task of the Holy Spirit, to make us more like Christ. And all of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit they are there, all of them, at once, working in every person after baptism. They are never separated. We all have all of the gifts. Scripture emphasizes two groups of blessings that the Holy Spirit gives to those who receive Him. First, there are the twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit. But I will not be talking into the details about the fruits of the Holy Spirit, because I really want to focus on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But someone who is first of all you know to be to live in accordance with the with our faith i mean obviously someone needs to be detached from mortal sin yeah because mortal sin kills the grace separates us from god and the gifts of the holy spirit are not working in us so the fruits of the holy spirit and that's how we can recognize people who um, are in tune with the Holy Spirit, have great spiritual life, are close to God, are Christ-like because of what they have. And the gifts, the twelve, the twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit are described in Galatians, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty. It's a big one these days self-control and chastity 
Who would have thought? But modesty is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It really is. I think something to preach about our Mass for the youth. In addition, the Holy Spirit endows us with blessings we traditionally call the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. These particular gifts are lasting. They are lasting. And what is interest, interesting about it, you know, how it is that um, what we do on earth or when we exercise our bodies, for example, our bodies will be left here. Yeah? They, will, they came from ashes and they will turn to ashes. But these gifts of the Holy Spirit, um, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, the teaching of the church, the tradition, they will actually be effective in heaven. For example, fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord and the um, most sacred part of fear of the Lord, the first gift of the Holy Spirit that I will talk about, will be exercised in heaven through reverence toward God when we are in heaven. So these are lasting but not indestructible because of sin, endowments that perfect the good habits and natural powers of the human soul and have the effect of making us supernaturally sensitive and supernaturally responsive to the guidance and inspiration of God. That's what it's all about. In everything, these seven gifts of wisdom, understanding, fear of the Lord, um, piety, and three more. Um, these are actually when someone is in tune with them, when you open your heart to the and, and make room for God first of all, yeah, to empty yourself out from the bad habits and expose yourself to good habits, to um, let the Holy Spirit work in you. It's all beautiful and good and and we can do that, but as we said in the beginning, these are gifts. And God gives His gifts according to His will and His understanding and His great wisdom. It's not that I will be just doing something all the time because I want a gift of wisdom and I will just find out the way or formula mathematically how to get this increase of wisdom and it will happen. It won't, unless God wants it. The prophet Isaiah speaks of these seven gifts when he writes prophesying about the coming of Christ. He says, a branch will sprout from the root of Jesse, and from his root a flower will rise up, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, Jesus, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of fortitude, a spirit of knowledge and of piety, and he shall be filled with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And as you will learn a little bit later, Jesus Christ, God himself, actually had the gift of fear of the Lord. Who did he fear? <laughs> he is the Lord, yeah? Well, he did have it in his human nature, a reverence towards God, the Father. These seven gifts, wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and fear of the Lord are spoken of throughout the scriptures and have been received and explained by saints throughout the ages. When we look at the, um, when you have beatification process or canonization process, they always look, um, the cardinals, whoever is involved in the um, investigation, they are checking if this person, particular person, who is a candidate to be uh, declared a saint or a blessed first always they check if he exercised the virtues heroically like to the limits in the perfect way and how do you do that to living out the gifts of the Holy Spirit they all have the we all have them after baptism St. Thomas Aquinas, my favorite these days, and St. Augustine, they speak about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and also in this article that I read um, about the Beatitudes, they connect them really nicely, but I will not be focusing on the Beatitudes. So what are the gifts exactly? The gifts of the Holy Spirit are blessings. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are blessings. 
given to our souls to enhance and refine the natural powers that our souls possess. Soul refers to the innermost aspect of man, that which is of greatest value in him, that by which he is most especially in God's image. Soul signifies the spiritual principle in men. And its source, of course, is in God. The seven gifts of the Holy Spirit enhance the powers of the soul and make more sensitive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Everything, our understanding. They are habitual dispositions that enable us to act in a holy and even godly-like way. Our disordered passions, we don't have any control over them. When we exercise when, um, the gifts, when we, first of all, to even start doing it, the first step always is to strive. That's why the first gift will be the fear of the Lord, is to say no to sin. And the first step is, if someone doesn't have enough charity in, in his heart, Obviously, the first thing will be to just say, I will not sin because I'm afraid of God. I'm afraid of the punishment. That's the initial thing, the lowest level of charity. Who needs these gifts? I don't. I have them all in perfect state. <laughs> hey. Um, we all need the gifts that will help us to find our way to Him who is the source and goal of our life. Without these gifts, it is impossible for us to overcome our weaknesses, vices, failures. <laughs> They're not like pills, remedy, you know. They strengthen us in following the good prompting of the Holy Spirit. It's like listening to the inner voice. Sometimes we feel like, you know, I just had this feeling. <laughs> and what is this feeling, if it's good? If the fruit of the action that followed this feeling was good, brought someone closer to God, or helped somebody, who was it? 95%, I would say. The good spirit. How do we obtain these gifts? They are all given to us in holy baptism. We have no control over how much of the particular gift we receive. It's totally up to God to decide. The real action of the operation of the uh, gifts depend on God. And that's what it is. How the gifts are actually operating in our soul is all up to God. That's how we may make ourselves... Um, what do you do with, with ground? If you want to toil the ground, if you want to prepare it for... Till. Till the, there you go. Till the ground. That's what we can do with our hearts, our souls. We can prepare for the ground for the Holy Spirit. And then God just presses the button and everything goes. He is the one who is in charge of these actions. Often we do not even know certain, that we possess certain gifts unless we carefully examine our actions in retrospect. That's what I said. Yeah, something happened there and you know when I look in a wow. I found myself in this little church and this little lady came up to me and she said, you know what, I think you should be a priest. That's what actually happened to me. And I said, you must be kidding me. <laughs> uh, so, okay, we have some powers too, actually to stop God from entering our heart, yeah? Isn't it cool? We have the power to block the effectiveness of these gifts, for example, by, and I love it, by stubbornness, selfishness, anger, all these little things that we actually do daily, yeah? All the time. That just shows how difficult it is really to exercise all these gifts, but it happens. Happens. I think I know people who exercise these gifts pretty well. Um, and they really are. Um, feel bad being around them because they are so holy. You know how it is being around holy people. So we have the power to block the effectiveness of these gifts just by little actions like that. But being selfish, angry, stubbornness, whatever, little sins, it all accumulates. You know how it is. 
how we sin. We say sometimes that, oh, little sin. It's not going to hurt anyone. It's not mortal sin. It's just a little sin. Well, then cut yourself 500 times with this little finger and it's just going to go off after a while, yeah? Not just a little sin. Cut, cut, cut. No finger. <laughs> These gifts become evident and appear clearly when we live a life of true charity. And they always appear all together. Because they reinforce and complement each other. And I think it will be kind of difficult sometimes to see the difference between these gifts because one of them is good counsel, one of them is understanding, one of them is wisdom. So that's pretty close to us, yeah, in definition, yeah. All has to do something with knowledge, with right direction, with guidance, with asking. But they actually have specific roles. So let's start the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Number one, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. What kind of a gift is that from God to fear Him? Yeah? Well, hello, I'm going to give you a gift so you can be afraid of me. <laughs> okay, well, it is the first step, as I said before. And um, I have um, an example from a confessional. No worries, I'm not going to say any since. Um, <laughs> But that's how it is. Sometimes, sometimes people say that um, they don't feel like they're really sorry. They, they, don't, they don't know. You know, it's difficult for me to say or that I'm doing it out of love for God. Okay? I don't know. Um, I want to say, so. Do you, are you sorry because you love God? You, I don't know how much I really love Him. I want to know love Him. But, are you sorry? Are you sorry for your sins because you offended God? I am sorry. For that I am sorry, because I offended God. All, and that's the first step. That's the initial step. Fear of the Lord. I will stop sinning because I know there is punishment for that sinning. I know I will be punished, eventually. Whoever it is. One of the people of our times, I think, was shot today. He's facing the Lord. That's what happens. No matter who you are here, <laughs> there you just by yourself, facing the judge himself and the loving Father, but also justice itself. You cannot go wrong with that. He will not go wrong. It is a first step, it makes us reverent, the fear of the Lord, that's the first gift, the fear of the Lord. It makes us reverent toward the one we should praise, and that's uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, God, we should praise Him, we are His creature. This is the basis, the foundation on which the rest of the gifts will be building up. Because as I said, the initial step in spiritual life also is, I will not sin because I'm afraid. That's initial step. There is not a lot of love in me towards God. I'll just say, you know, because it's kind of scary, this hell stuff. It is like with... Um, okay, I already said that. And, by the way, so you know, um, contrition is required. Perfect contrition is required to, uh, for the absolution to be valid. I mean, for the, uh, for the uh, confession to be valid. So what does it? Who elevates your imperfect contrition? The absolution. The words of absolution elevate imperfect contrition to the perfect contrition through the passion of Jesus Christ. That's how this works. And that's what... Yes. Imperfect contrition is elevated by the words of absolution, by the passion of Jesus Christ, to the perfect contrition because of His sacrifice on the cross. And the Father receives the sacrifice and absolves the sins. Even if we are, because obviously we are imperfect, we may say, I really contrite for this sin, but is it a perfect contrition? 
I hope it is. Like all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, fear of the Lord is a habitual perfection of the powers of the soul that makes the believer responsive to the inspiration and movements of the Holy Spirit. It's like getting to know someone and recognizing the inner voice. These are the perfections. Recognizing the inner voice that it's setting me on the right path on prayer. It's like I can pray only in this place or I can pray only in that place. In this place I cannot focus on but I'm going to the right place. God works in my heart to set me on the right path towards Him. Without being res receptive to God and willing to learn, how can we enjoy the other gifts? That's why we have this. The fear of the Lord is not a matter of terror or anxiety. For people, in order to be good, they must first withdraw from evil. That's why God puts the fear of, the, of Himself into their hearts. And now, there are two ways in which fear plays a role in our relationship with God. Two ways, two different fears. Um, first, we can fear the punishment called hell. And this fear is called the servile servile fear. It's like the servant is afraid of his master. Not a lot of feelings that are involved. It's just the master, yeah? I work for him. That's as I said before. Not a very deep relationship. That's the servant. Obeying the master because of the fear of being punished. And the second fear, second type of fear, and this is what we exercise, afraid of, well, we should, it's afraid of losing God or afraid of losing the relationship with God through sinning and that's love how many people in love here <laughs> many people in love what do you fear to lose the object of your love yeah, clearly hopefully <laughs> sorry <laughs> afraid of losing God called feel your fear because of the relationship of a father and a son which involves not only blood relationship but also relationship um, through the lineage um, son would have that fearing to break the law of his father or the relationship with him so more personal type of fear this is a gift of the Holy Spirit this gift transforms the way we re regard God through fear of the Lord, we become deeply sensitive to anything. We become deeply sensitive to anything that might diminish our life of loving God and of enjoying His love. As St. Thomas explained, love is the mother. Love is the mother of which fear is born. For a person fears to lose only what he loves. Makes sense now. So did Jesus fear God while being God? What Christ feared, what he was eager never to lose, was what is most overwhelming in God. His infinite love. But, it has to be clarified. Jesus, Jesus human soul, human soul was moved under the impulses of the Holy Spirit to a profoundly awed reverence of God. St. Thomas Aquinas, take him as my advocate, I would never say that alone, comments that as men Christ had a deeper sense of reverence for God than anyone else ever had. Which is logical. Because he, in his human, uh, so perfect, perfectly exercised the gifts. The effects of the fear are, the effects of the fear are humility, because we recognize there is someone greater than us, an enhancement of hope, which is kind of weird. So we will not grow proud about things. Fear and hope work together. Hope is confident 
that God will do great things for us while fear keeps us pure and humble in the perfect state to receive the loving graces of God. Thank you. Fear of the Lord opens the way to doing good, the initial way. In the heaven, the holiest part of fear, as I said before, that's how we take these gifts to heaven, because they go with the soul, yeah? The soul doesn't stay here after death, it goes before God first. In heaven, the holiest part of fear attached to the soul, which is reverence for God, will remain. What is the second gift and now we have what is it 30 pages <laughs> sorry <laughs> what is the second gift ah, gift of piety the gift of piety is the particular oh, now we can talk about piety all day long it is not external piety whoa <laughs> To those, yeah? <laughs> it is not external piety. It's not showing off to the world that I am pious and I will go get down on my knees in front of everyone and then get back home and just yell at everyone the whole day long. That is not exercising any gifts and not certainly piety. This gift of piety enables one to come to God paying the kind of homage and worship that is appropriate, appropriate and best. It's something more than fear of the Lord, yeah? Father, and this is, this is just, uh, this is taken from our prayers of the liturgy, uh, prayers of the liturgy, uh, I think it's on Sunday. Father, you have no need of our praise, that's what we say at Mass. Yet our desire to thank you is in itself your gift. Our prayer of thanksgiving adds nothing to your greatness, but makes us grow in your grace through Jesus Christ our Lord, as always. And it's an interesting line here, yet our desire to thank you, the desire that we think is ours, is in itself your gift. And also this gift of piety helps us to recognize the ultimate purpose of our existence. God puts us in the world to know, to love, and to serve Him. And so to come to paradise. I will move on. I will not give this to you, but I will tell you where to find the whole thing, because I just chose some more most important parts of out of this gifts we have six more to go but i will tell you the article is excellent i think and you should all read it often mis oh, there it is often misinterpreted and paradigmed by misconceptions prejudices and stero stereotypes <laughs> When we confuse true piety with a kind of pretended sweetness, with superficial exterior devotion, and with fake emotionalism in church, it happens often, really. And God is not pleased with that kind of thing. I don't want to look at anyone now. <laughs> That's why I'm not looking. <laughs> but it happens all the time. I've seen it at seminaries also. Yeah, we are not free from it. We do the same thing, priests. Yeah. Pious. It has authentic piety is far from all these things. Real piety is a virtue that govern our behavior at all times. All times. And not only when we are engaged in prayer, worship, and other acts of religious devotion. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. But when we you know, it probably takes a whole life to exercise. But otherwise, it, connects, it, it creates a disconnection between 
our actions in a certain place and then our actions in a certain in a different place. St. Thomas Aquinas explains that it is concerned with fulfilling our duty and conscious service towards those who are significant in our life, especially our parents. <coughs> and also, believe it or not, this gift involves patriotism, our duty and devotion to our country. And I could read you the whole thing, but I'm not going to. As a matter of justice, giving each person what is his due. Piety impels us to show gratitude and appreciation to anyone who is a source of life, maturity, human development, and personal enrichment in our life. I mean being selective with our friends also, just on a human level. As we exercise our gifts in community, never alone, we are not loners, we are all made for relationships, that's how we are, human beings. But remembering also that relationships have great effect on us, great effect. And we cannot really exercise certain, some of these gifts with people who have no values, moral values, or their way of life is completely different than ours. We may say, oh, I'm doing it because I'm going to convert this person. Or you will deprive yourself of the gifts you have. Like all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the gift of piety is a lasting perfection of the powers of the specific. They make us readily responsive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, like all of the gifts, with regard to honoring God as our Father. Made receptive by the gift of piety, we are led to honor and serve God in the spirit of sonship. Requires a relationship deeper than the fear of the Lord and the basic, the servile fear. We are brought to participate very practically in the sonship of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. A son, a child looks at a loving father, a loving father with respect respect and also with questioning with asking for guidance love exchange for piety like god remains concerned with coming to the aid of those in need saint thomas aquinas says in this regard who says that we pay homage to those whom we cherish by doing honor either to their memory or their company by reaching out to others in their actual struggles we honor the Father by saving His children, serving His children. Also, it's important, sometimes we think that um, prayer is the most important thing. More important than people. For example, we pray, someone interrupts us, we're supposed to help this person. No, don't even bother, because I am praying right now, yes? That's the most important thing. I am getting to know my God. And hello. <laughs> God is not pleased with a prayer like that. When your brother is suffering right now, you have no charity for him, no time. Saints, when you read some of their biographies, they tell you. That's what it is. You leave prayer. You go and help your... And that's your prayer. That's faith in action. We cannot be confused here. It's very tempting sometimes to just stay on your knees in silence and don't help. But that is not the right way. You go and help your brother. Exercise the gifts. Push yourself. Grow in holiness. Piety fills the heart with eagerness to do works of mercy. And I'm reading these things because that's how you recognize when you have the promptings to do certain things that are good, you can, by looking at these gifts again over and over, recognize which gift is becoming stronger in your heart. What is, it, you, it, it really is possible to sometimes to, to recognize. And you give thanks to our Heavenly Father, obviously, for that. Not say, well, I just, it's, I did it. I did it. No, you didn't. The gift's <laughs> principal act of filial reverence for God will remain even in heaven. For the deep affection that we have for others will only increase as we enter into the rejoicing of the saints. 
In heaven, piety is exercised as the saints manifest their love for God by honoring Him. Next gift. In the middle of this stadium where everybody is red. And he looks around and they look at him and it goes, the sound goes, you're not going anywhere for a moment. <laughs> Snickers. <laughs> Yeah, it really is good when you can when you can see it, but what can I do? <laughs> I'm dressed up in black. I hope not. The gift of knowledge. <laughs> the gift of knowledge. How can we know what we need to believe? All this confusion now, knowledge. Don't um see thinking about Polish. I forgot the word. Uh, <laughs> Don't confuse, thank you, don't confuse this with uh, wisdom, knowledge, wisdom, two different gifts. So what to believe? One grace God gives us to enable us, the gift of knowledge, to enable us to make a complete and penetrating agreement to the truth of faith in the gifts of knowledge. The gift of knowledge is a perfection of a human mind that disposes us to follow the impulses of the Holy Spirit when we judge human or created things in relation to God. Creation, for example. How is it making sense? All this knowledge, all this contradiction going on with evolution sometimes, with the saint. Remembering always that this is a gift. We sometimes wonder, we priests too, we sometimes wonder why this truth is presented in a, such a clear way by St. Thomas Aquinas, it's so clear that children can read. Um, by St. Thomas Aquinas, for example, and, and the teachers will explain it to you, it all makes sense. Why is this person not believing? Because has no gift of faith, gift of knowledge, of the divine things. God is not concerned here with the material things. If he is, only he is because they have some relation to him and they can lead someone, like our, our friend here, led to God through music. Gift of knowledge. Where is this music from? Where is the source of it? The divine music. It's so beautiful. God could, uh, human mind could not create it. It comes from somewhere else. Through the gift of knowledge, the Holy Spirit guides our judgment so that we can recognize created things, especially human thoughts, words, inclinations, circumstances, and deeds in the light of faith. The gift of knowledge when operative is concerned with differentiating between what is and what is not consistent with faith. But it also, and someone needs to be a believer probably for a longer time, to recognize how this gift works. Um, studying theology is a good way, I bet, Mark, I bet some of you probably have. You just have this sense that what you're reading is true, and you have a sense of heresy when it's not true, isn't it? It is. Well, I sometimes, you know, have to read twice or three times before I find it, but, <laughs> but I find it eventually. Or I back my words up with St. Thomas Aquinas. It's never wrong. God enables us to recognize when a human and temporal thing, a plan, a practice, an idea ought to be received as consistent with the revealed truth or not. and this is pretty important and obvious, our human knowledge depends on a process of reasoning and logical progress, not like angels or God. We naturally need examples, arguments, diagrams, evidence, illustrations, pictures, instructions, and many other helps before we can know anything with certainty. All of these things but the matters of faith and certainty sometimes just don't go together. And of course, we can make mistakes. God doesn't. And what was the line about logical, being logical? Can you, can you say it to all of them? Because I liked it. Sure. 
Um, there's an Indian poet, his name is uh, Ramadranath Tagora, and uh, he said, we were talking a little bit about uh, the dangers of, uh, of reason, and so he, he said that a, a mind all logic is like a knife all blade, it cuts the hand that uses it. Exactly. <laughs> Reason, I mean, our intelligence can be very, very, very dangerous. We know that. Because our reason can just go, can, our reasoning can ask of us too many examples, too many explanations, too many logical explanations forgetting that our reason cannot enter the source of reasoning our ideas about God even when true remember that our ideas about God even when true are not the same as God himself these are our ideas we are thinking about something that it's incomprehensible I'm glad that I can pronounce this thing incomprehensible <laughs> It's God. Every time we attempt to think about what's going to be in heaven, we find ourselves just be short of imagination. Because everything we know is created by God. The paradise, the beautiful things, um, the um, um, islands somewhere away. I mean, all our ideas are based on what is already created. <laughs> we cannot go beyond that. And God says, Jesus says, in the scriptures, that what is awaiting those who believe in me is beyond your company. Not even an ear has heard or an eye has seen what I have prepared for those who believe in me. Hmm? We have not heard it, we have not seen it. So how can we even try to attempt to imagine what is there? We can, but our ideas about God even when true are not the same as God himself and that's a fruit of knowledge divine therefore pure truth remains the gifts main concern pure truth and I love talking about the truth because Jesus says about truth I am the truth I am the way and I am the life and what is truth in our times very difficult to recognize the truth very difficult among so many different opinions that are given to us on the plate and take it. What is the truth? What is the thing that will lead me to God? Knowledge then also prevents us from being mis misled with regard to the moral life and in principle matter that bear on the faith. So many attacks. The Catholic Church is under attack because of our teaching about regarding more faith and morals, protecting human life, all these things. And um, and why? Because so many people have difficulties recognizing the truth in it. And truth is challenging. And what was the famous line? I will tell you the truth. Oh no, you cannot handle the truth. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Jack Nicholson, there you go. <laughs> I should not be quoting him, but <laughs> it's RCIA. But that's how it was. You cannot handle the truth. You don't want to know it because it will challenge you in such a way that you will not be able to respond or accept it. Uh-oh. We witness the efficacy of the gift of knowledge and the holiness of the saints. How they are making decisions, the right faith, the justice, straight path. Skip two pages. The gift of fortitude. I like that one. Want to be courageous priest, yes? The gift of fortitude. A first blush, it might, yeah, there you go. And the gift of fortitude and the, the fear of the Lord and what is this, like contradiction? But it's not. Um, gift of fortitude, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that fortitude, also called courage, is that kind of firmness of mind and spirit that we need both for doing good and for enduring evil enduring suffering being courageous that's a gift from God too the divine warriors all these people who fought for for God who gave their life for God in the midst of suffering and hopelessness who faced the lions 
Well, how about the gift of fortitude? We require this. We we require this steadfastness, especially when embracing good and uh, eschewing evil. Be evil become more difficult. Fortitude makes our mind competent to confront and to endure dangers. This is pretty straightforward. The Holy Spirit moves our human mind in a way that exceeds its natural particular abilities so that we enjoy a full and perfectly well-founded confidence in the strength of God. That means balance. That means being able in the face of danger um, open our mind and heart to God and be actually balanced and not afraid focus on him but as we always say these are um, habitual uh, things it's a habit of our heart to do that you cannot do it that's why that's why saints are able we call them saints because they are able they exercise the virtues to the perfect to the fullness because they are able in the midst of suffering say I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm gonna die and most of the people would <laughs> run away yeah I am not gonna die today maybe sometime other than today because they don't have this habit of their heart it's not habitual for them to call upon God and say I am ready they're not ready yet it's like you know going to the gym and, and bunch pressing for 100 pounds well go the first time you've never bench pressed yeah I never bench pressed 400 but 300 yeah <laughs> Whoever our will is hindered from obeying the this dictates of right reason. Fortitude steps in to remove obstacles. Courage therefore helps our wills to conform right, rightly to reason in the fate in the face of greatest evils. Courage preserves the attachment of the human will to what is truly good, and what is truly good. It's always coming from God. The gift of counsel. We have, I think, two more. As we noted above in our uh, discussion of the gift of knowledge, we human beings are rational creatures. Typically, our actions follow some degree of th forethought and consideration before. Typically, not always, unfortunately, but typically. We ponder and mull and study, muse and remediate, and we seek our expert opinions, rely on others' experiences. All this is characteristic of thinking, self-reflecting being can be referred as taking counsel. That's what we do. And there is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of counsel. And as human beings, we are in a constant state of searching for something. Only in God will men find the truth and happiness he never steps, stops searching for. He cannot live fully according to the truth unless he freely acknowledges God's love and entrusts himself to his Creator. Such directing comes to us from heaven through the, spirit of, through the Spirit's gift of counsel. We are guided by the very advice of God. That's what it is. The gift of counsel remains wholly specific and practical in its orientation. It is given for the sake of our guidance to a very particular goal. The gift of counsel does not bring us assistance in worldly affairs. <laughs> like what will be the number for lottery? Rather, this gift makes us responsive to the enlightenment of God in everything that pertains to the goal of eternal life. Just like with wisdom, the gift of counsel corresponds to the moral virtue known as prudence. Something interesting about it, and St. Thomas Aquinas, know, uh, known as the um, angelic doctor, St. Thomas notes that even the angels in heaven consult God regarding their duties as our protectors and guardians. The all-wise promptings they receive from God also come from the Spirit through a gift of counsel perfectly suited to the angelic intelligence. But ours is different. 
If the angels, in all their power and holiness, stand in need of God's practical advice, and this is to humble us, how much more do we, who are ignorant, weak, and, and still on our trial, need God's counsel? And after death, this gift remains with us. St. Thomas notes that even in the blessed, there are some acts to be done that are ordered to an end, such as giving praise to God, or drawing others to the destination they have attained. The last one, I think? No. The gift of understanding, let me just see, I think it is, maybe the last one, you hope. So much of the sorrow we experience seems to be caused by a lack of understanding, and this is obviously true. Should I go, or should I just stop? Go. Okay. <laughs> That's consoling. Okay, then relax. Sit back. <laughs> Great line, so much sorrow that we experience comes from lack of understanding. Why are we trying to understand God again? Why? It's a human thing to do, yes? But it will never happen in this life. We should never bother. That's what it is and His will is happening and His will is always goodness. It's always directed towards good. It's always to save a person, not to condemn a person. Always. That's what it is. And lack of understanding creates problems. We don't understand people, but also we want people to understand us. Isn't it the first thing we want? Especially in school. I see it in children all the time. We deeply feel the need for others to understand us for who we are. That is, we long for others to know us in an all-embracing way that includes a profound appreciation. We want to be appreciated. We want people to appreciate the uniqueness that we represent because God took time to create every single little detail about ourselves. God also wants to be understood by us. Meaning, and he wants his will to be accepted. And so he blesses us through the Holy Spirit with the gift of understanding to endows us with a certain intimate knowledge of himself to understand God. Well, why, did he, why, is it, why is this happening? I don't know. But God knows and he lets it happen. Because God always brings goodness out of evil. St. Thomas Aquinas observes that human knowledge starts from the outside, through our senses. However, the natural light of understanding that we possess bears only limited power. The divine understanding implies a center, certain excellence of knowledge by inward penetration. St. Thomas notes that the main purpose of the gift is to effect in the believer a spiritual sureness of faith. The function of the gift of understanding then is to enable us to see into the meaning, the core and inner truth of the principles of what we know in the light of grace. Our final end, we are called to embrace beatific communion with God, where we can see God face to face and contemplate. Um, some people say that that would be boring. Especially children, yeah? What do you mean you're going to contemplate God for the whole eternity? Can you imagine an eternity? Yeah. Well, the feeling of, of peacefulness, complete possession by God, um, a soul consumed and completely given to the source of this soul will not be bored. Will be contemplating the absolute for the rest of eternity, perfectly happy and peace. For understanding reveals to us how God's eternal and necessary truth serve and steadfast standards for human conduct. In a special way, the gift of understanding gives us privileges, privileged access to the meaning of the sacred scriptures. For understanding enlightens our mind regarding things we have heard or read. 
So that's a beautiful gift. Meditating on the scriptures. Trying to find the right meaning, not the... Not the right meaning, the other meaning of the scripture. Because scriptures is the bearer of truth. The author is the Holy Spirit. But it can be misinterpreted, as we all know. At the same time, even if we occasionally lack a certain clarity and intellectual acuity regarding particular articles of faith proposed to us, and that goes back to my previous lecture, some things will just not be explained. We should not jump to the conclusion that understanding has failed us. We should not jump to the conclusion that understanding has failed us. On the contrary, as believers, we can with confidence understand that such articles of faith, as Trinity, as the person of Christ, are to be believed and not to be abandoned on account of anything else. For a spiritual people, the ultimate authority in our life is not our unguided intellect, as brilliant as it may seem, but the divine insight and inspiration of the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit shared with us in the manner and to the extent that he sees feet. Blessed are the pure of heart, the simple of heart. Yeah? Because they accept the truth without asking. That's what they do. Simple hearted people. That's why they are so close to Jesus Christ. Always. He surrounds himself with them. Because they look at him like a little baby looks at us as a father and the father says, go step into this fireplace. Okay, Daddy, I'll go, because I have a pure heart, I have nothing there, nothing that prevents me from believing you. But we have so much that prevents us from believing God. But the simple of heart, they will possess heaven. In our present condition, the pilgrim way, the gift of understanding empowers us to see not what God is, but what God is not. In this life, the better we know God, the more we understand that He surpasses whatever the mind grasps. I want to finish here, but I can't. And with this, knowing ignorance, this knowing that we do not yet fully know, comes a deep and abiding peace, or should come. Okay, this is the last one. The gift of wisdom. St. Thomas Aquinas, looking into etymology, says that it's, it's taste. That's what it says. The gift of wisdom is then a special taste for God and the truth about God. You know, knowledge is not wisdom. We have so many people, very wise, who did not study a lot, who did not read many books, like my grandmother was. She didn't read too much. Very wise woman. Very pious, very holy. Wisdom is where knowledge and experience coexist. The Holy Spirit's gift of wisdom belongs to the graced person who knows the cost that is simply the highest without qualification, namely God. For wisdom implies a certain righteous rightness of judgment in contemplating and in consulting divine realities. And in knowing it radically transforms the wise person's life. Knowing God transforms the person. The gift of wisdom, unlike acquired knowledge, comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. At the same time, the gift of wisdom presupposes supernatural faith. And now, as I said before, wisdom abides in all those who live in a state of grace, free of mortal sin. It cannot coexist with moral sin. You know what? It's the end. But <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's it.
There is more, but um, I think we are okay. Yes? You were going to give us your source? I will tell you the source, yes. You can write it down. One of the sources for the gifts. Not the other, the other one, I just found somewhere else. But um, this one is excellent. You all should read it. It's called... <laughs> it's called um, The Gifts of the Holy Spirit by Peter John Cameron, OP, Dominican. Peter John Cameron, C-A-M-O R O N him <laughs> no copyright so you can delete that but <laughs> but it's an online it's online so it's a great and it also will be um, showing you in this in this article it's like 50 pages maybe it, he will also talk about um, how our Lady exercised the gifts and he will connect them with the virtues and he will connect them with the seven beatitudes, you know, blessed are the poor of heart, etc. It's great. Thank you. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.